Hi, uh, my name is Stefan Zorn. I'm an assistant professor here at Johns Hopkins uh, in the Department of Radiology. And today I'm going to talk to you about cardiovascular CT. And we're going to review uh, common and uncommon sources of misdiagnosis and how to avoid them. So just as a background, uh, cardiovascular CT really pushes the speed and spatial resolution limits of current scanner technology. We optimize our protocols to reduce errors. However, in some cases, artifacts are unavoidable. Also, we're confronted sometimes by normal anatomic structures that mimic, mimic pathology. Um, some of these diagnoses that we're talking about may be overlooked if not part of a standard search pattern. And really, the important take home here is that knowledge of all these various potential sources of error is critical to avoid misdiagnosis. So this is really an outline of what we're going to go over today, various types of error in uh, cardiovascular CT. And we're going to review uh, artifacts that um, are typically related to the scanning itself. Um, those are contrast artifacts, uh, as well as reconstruction errors um, uh, related to the post-processing uh, of the data or, or, or motion during the acquisition. Then we'll go over some normal and abnormal structures. Um, normal structures that maybe are not typically encountered on non-gated, non-cardiac exams that we may not be familiar with um, if we're not uh, doing a lot of cardiac imaging. Um, some variants in vascular branching patterns um, and pericardial issues. And then go over some abnormal structures. Um, there are some benign cardiovascular structures that may be misdiagnosed as something more uh, sinister and more serious. And then um, there are actually some common misdiagnoses um, of abnormalities that are frequently not included in the CD search pattern, which we will review. Okay. So first, let's talk about contrast. So streak artifacts. So we all know uh, about streak artifacts. You see them all the time, uh, routinely on a day-to-day -day basis. They happen because of highly concentrated intravenous contrast that results in low attenuation artifacts due to beam hardening effects. And these artifacts can mimic filling defects. And I think we're all probably familiar with this kind of artifact where um, on the, uh, in the right chest here, we have this uh, um, low attenuation focus in the middle of the pulmonary artery right next to this very, very high attenuation superior vena cava containing uh, contrast. And this is something that looks just like a pulmonary uh, embolization and certainly could be mistaken for it. Um, what do you have to do to exclude that? Well, you go to uh, other views and here's coronal and sagittal images of the same abnormality. And we can see that on the coronal and sagittal images, we can see that this low attenuation lesion actually is linear in appearance and it seems to be emanating from the actual streak uh, um, uh, high attenuation contrast itself and so this is not a typical appearance for a thrombus but much 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 more typical for streak artifact and so you can confidently say that this is not a real clot but rather an artifact related to streak. Um, we certainly encounter these artifacts in coronary CT as well um, this is a case of a patient who had um, some blurring uh, of, of um, high attenuation material from the right atrium um, that created this streak through the proximal right coronary artery, which really looks a lot like um, calcium. Uh, and so in this case, it might be hard to say that this is not calcified plaque, um, but it turns out when you go to the non -cal uh, the, the calcium scoring examination, you see sure enough there is no calcium there, and it's all just artifact related to the presence of high attenuation contrast in the right atrium that's causing streak. Um, streak artifact can be problematic in the setting of uh, the superior vena cava in people with catheters. So um, high attenuation contrast can obscure pathology. So in this case, you see this patient has very, very high attenuation contrast in the right side, um, particularly in the superior vena cava and the right atrium. And the patient obviously has very poor cardiac function because you don't see any filling of the left side of the heart and you see reflux into the hepatic veins here. Um, but what can happen when you have this very high attenuation streak, uh, high attenuation contrast is if you don't window correctly, you can't actually see through the contrast and you may miss findings that are obscured by this high attenuation contrast. In this case, the patient had quite a lot of clot um, adherent to this catheter that we would have missed if we had not gone to a, a wider window, um, um, such as a bone window, for instance. So just something to be aware of.
what are some of the solutions to streak artifacts? Well, uh, one is that you can do dual bolus injection techniques. In this case, you will follow your um, high, high attenuation contrast with a saline chaser, um, usually around 20 to 40 mils of saline. Um, you inject at the same speed, typically, that you injected the um, first uh, high attenuation contrast. And what it does is it basically it just pushes the contrast out of the superior vena cava and the right atrium. And this um, basically eliminates the problem of streak artifact if you time it correctly. The other possibility is you could perform a delayed scan. So if you have any artifacts um, and you're unsure about what's happening there, do a delayed scan. That'll give some time for that high attenuation contrast to clear. And then you can see what's happening, um, um, whether those artifacts persist. So here's just an example of the difference between single and dual phase injections. This is something taken from the literature, a nice article about um, biphasic and, and even triphasic injection protocols showing this streak artifact in the right atrium, how it can really obscure the right coronary artery in the setting of cardiac CT here. And this is a patient with a dual phase injection where you have that um, saline, which is now flushing out the um, right atrium and the right ventricle. So um, what other contrast artifacts might we encounter? So the other one we see very frequently is mixing artifacts. And mixing of low attenuation non-enhanced blood with enhanced blood can result in artifacts. And these flow patterns that we see may actually result in something that looks a lot like a thrombus. And in addition, slow flow um, might result in layering of contrast in the dependent portion of the vessel, which can also be a little bit confusing uh, when we encounter it with our imaging techniques. So here's an example of a patient with contrast mixing artifact that looks a lot like a thrombus. So in this case, there's contrast coming back from the renal veins. And because of the way the, the, the blood flows, it tends to stream along the walls of the inferior vena cava rather than in the middle of the cava. And so it looks like you've got a filling defect in the middle of the inferior vena cava. The way you resolve this, well, one thing you can do is delayed scans. The other thing you can do is you can look on the coronal images. In this case, you see this very typical pattern where it's low attenuation, and then you get to the renal veins, and you see the high attenuation coming in, and then you see it streaming upward, and you get that kind of mixing, swirling appearance. And so that's pretty diagnostic of it being um, just a, 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 um, a mixing artifact rather than an actual thrombus. But just as a caveat, you really should make sure to keep in mind that it is possible um, to have a problem in the reverse direction that you have actually true pathology that you may mistakenly uh, call um, a mixing artifact. So in this case, this is a patient with a history of renal cell carcinoma that was resected. And the renal cell carcinoma that was resected, the, the, he had a right nephrectomy. And they actually, um, he had tumor involving the cava. They had to actually pull out of the cava. And so this is many years later, and the patient has recurrence. You can see on the right-hand image, he actually has a, an adrenal recurrence. But then also, he has this enhancement in the cava. And so in this case, it kind of looks reminiscent of that previous study we saw where there's uh, um, contrast um, streaming out of the left renal vein and swirling in the uh, IVC. But in this case, it's actually not contrast, it's tumor. So how do you know? Well, um, it, it's pretty tough on these images. Um, if you have the whole data set, it becomes a little more clear. Um, and then certainly when you have delayed images, um, which most of you know most people use multiple phases when they're evaluating for renal cell carcinoma, um, that shows you that these abnormalities persist uh, in the cava. So just something to be aware of. Um, don't dismiss something as a um, mixing artifact when it could be true pathology. This is another example of true pathology that looks a lot like what we saw before. This is an actual thrombus. Um, in this case, it um, looks a lot like on the left-hand side what we saw two images ago, or two slides ago, I should say. But um, certainly on the right-hand side, when you go to the coronal image, you can see that this is um, much more clearly a actual um, thrombus hanging off the top of the IVC filter there. You can also see that there's some enhancement of the IVC inferior to the thrombus, so it's nicely outlined by contrast. And, um, you know, this is certainly a, an actual true thrombus. So um, I had mentioned slow flow. So, so why does slow flow cause problems? Well, well sometimes um, you have uh, a patient who has large aneurysms or maybe poor um, cardiac output or, or a combination of both, and you get um, uh, 
uh, in a situation where you have a large aneurysm and it looks like it's incompletely filled with contrast. And so the differential here is that you could have um, slow flow and it just hasn't quite filled the whole thing up yet, or um, there could be thrombus or clot in there. Um, you also may get in a situation where the vessels downstream from this aneurysm actually may have um, differential uh, enhancement. And so in this case, this is a patient where he had this big aneurysm, and just downstream we see that there's no enhancement of the superficial femoral artery, but there's uh, decent enhancement, or uh, I should say normal enhancement, of the deep uh, femoral artery here. So if you had only this phase, you would think that this superficial femoral artery is occluded. Well, it turns out, though, um, we were just dealing with streaming of contrast through the aneurysm with incomplete mixing. When we went to the delayed phase, we see that this um, superficial femoral artery is well enhanced. Um, and this patient did not have an occlusion, but rather it was just an artifact um, due to slow flow. So something to be aware of. We've also encountered this problem in people with large dissections. You can see variable rates of flow in the true and false lumen. So in this case, the patient has this big dissection, big posterior false lumen. You can see the enhancement of the true lumen is quite brisk. You have nice enhancement, nice corticomedullary differentiation in the right kidney, but the left kidney looks like it's infarcted. And there's no enhancement whatsoever in the left kidney. Now, this was a little bit funny because I knew this patient had a chronic dissection and the dissection had been there for years and we'd been following him for years, but it was strange that the patient would have this infarct but have no atrophy. Um, you know, if the infarct was due to the dissection, you would expect that there'd be some atrophy since it is a chronic finding. Um, so that was a little bit strange. And then sure enough, we actually looked on the coronal image and we see, again, what looks like an infarct only affecting the upper pole of the left kidney. Um, fortunately for us, um, this patient actually had a delayed image which showed really striking example of how you can have this differential flow creating a problem. Here, normal enhancement of the left kidney in the upper pole, um, a little bit delayed compared to the right side, but certainly there's no infarct here. And that was basically just an artifact of slow flow um, through the false lumen, which was supplying that left um, upper, uh, upper portion of the left kidney. Um, just another example of slow flow and how that can really kind of mis can, can be mistaken for thrombus or can be misleading. This is a case um, we had a patient who had a very large aneurysm of the right coronary artery. Um, this was a cardiac CT actually performed elsewhere and it was read as a thrombosed um, coronary aneurysm and it looks like the distal RCA is also thrombosed. Um, there's no flow in the RCA here. Um, Coincidentally, the patient also had these very large adrenal masses that were being evaluated by um, abdominal CT, and we um, performed an abdominal CT scan without gating, and we saw um, just coincidentally that this patient actually had this huge RCA aneurysm. This was only a day later, um, and it was completely opacified with contrast. So the um, aneurysm here, which, which was interpreted as thrombus, was clearly incorrectly interpreted. Interpreted It was rather not thrombus, but just uh, such a big aneurysm that not enough time had passed for it to fill up with contrast. So this can be a problem. So something to be aware of, very, very large aneurysms may fill slowly with contrast, um, and the vessels downstream may also fill slowly with contrast. So there's just something to be aware of. <clears throat> you don't want to be too quick to call everything thrombosed, and you might consider getting delayed scans. This is a problem which we've been seeing more and more of lately, which is um, I think as we're imaging faster, uh, we're, we're picking up more of these cases um, than we did in the past. And this is a, a patient who is being evaluated for pulmonary embolism, and they have very, very poor cardiac output. Um, as I, I alluded on in a previous case, when you see this kind of situation where you have extraordinarily bright contrast in the right side of the heart, the pulmonary arteries, and no contrast whatsoever on the left side of the heart. You know, the kind of the ultimate pulmonary embolism study. Generally, that only happens when you have somebody who has very, very poor cardiac output. And so we've started to notice lately these patients where we have these things that look like just like pulmonary emboli. So in this case, this is a somewhat branching structure here and the anterior aspect uh, of the right lung, um, and it looks like there's a, um, a, a small thrombus. Um, I would 
point your attention to the pulmonary arteries here, you can see that there's incomplete mixing of the uh, non-opacified uh, non and um, opacified blood in the pulmonary arteries here, so you have these mixing artifacts. So that suggests that maybe this patient were imaging perhaps a little bit early, um, and there's still some mixing artifacts in the main pulmonary arteries. So um, in this case, we thought, well, maybe this thing here could be a mixing artifact as well. So we weren't entirely convinced that this was a pulmonary embolism. We actually um, brought the patient back, re-injected. We had I told the um, technologist, you know, make sure to wait longer this time. Give them an extra 10, 15 seconds than when you would normally trigger. And sure enough, on this case, we saw that that uh, artifactual um, pulmonary embolism actually went away. And so this is completely um, a mixing artifact. And we have actually encountered this quite a few times um, since this case. Um, and I think, again, this is probably a function of sick patients with fast scanners. Uh, in the past, maybe we weren't scanning quite so fast, so we would never catch it quite early enough to see these abnormalities. But now that we're using faster scanner technology, um, we're, we're starting to catch um, uh, these uh, very, very early phases of the scan where you still have mixing artifact in the pulmonary arteries. Um, one other artifact we can see related to flow and, and contrast mixing is this pseudothromus in the left atrial appendage. This is a patient who has um, had a big uh, left atrium, had atrial fibrillation, and sure enough has this big area of non-opacification in the tip of the left atrial appendage. You'd be hard-pressed to say this isn't a clot. Um, one thing that helps you say maybe it could be an artifact is that you don't see nice sharp edges, but rather you see a smooth kind of gradation in attenuation posteriorly, and this is pretty typical for pseudothrombus. And in this case, we were lucky enough to get a delayed image, and sure enough, we saw that there was no clot in the left atrial appendage. This is just the fact that the appendage here is not filled with contrast yet. It has, enough time hasn't passed, and this is particularly problematic in patients who have poor left atrial function, um, dilated left atria, say, from atrial fibrillation. Here's another example of uh, typical appearance of this entity. Um, so pseudothrombus in the left atrial appendage, you see this horizontal line, that can help you. So that's kind of a nice um, example of layering of contrast. So that tells you it's probably not a clot. Usually clots are more lobulated and again, very sharp and well demarcated. If you had any concern, if you weren't really sure, then what you can do is re-image the patient with a delay. Um, another uh, case that we've encountered, another scenario that we've encountered where um, patients can have mixing artifacts or, or abnormal in, uh, filling that simulate thrombus in the setting of congenital heart disease. This is a patient with a very complex congenital heart disease that was repaired by um, a Fontan conduit. That's this right here. So the patient basically has essentially a, a single ventricle circulation and the inferior vena cava blood is being routed into the pulmonary arteries. And so this conduit here continues with is continuous with this conduit here, which goes over to the left pulmonary artery. Um, it turns out that this IVC conduit was going to the left PA and the superior vena cava was going to the right PA. Um, and the question was, is this clotted? Um, because the patient was, was having new shortness of breath. Um, and it was actually read in an outside study. It was called, outside um, institution, it's called um, large pulmonary embolism. Well, it turns out that what's going on here is we just haven't given enough time for the contrast to mix. In this case, the contrast has to come through the inferior vena cava up into the conduit in the left pulmonary artery. And if you're imaging in the early arterial phase, you're not going to allow enough time for that um, contrast to circulate below the diaphragm and come back into the chest. So uh, the solution, do a delayed phase image, which we did. And um, you can see here that there's homogeneous opacification of the the chest veins here, superior vena cava, subclavian vein aorta, as well as this conduit. So no thrombus, the patient's fine. Um, so you can avoid um, you know, uh, anticoagulation or other issues with this patient um, just by using proper technique. So um, just to summarize, what are some solutions for mixing artifacts that we may encounter? Um, delayed scans um, should confirm thrombus if there's any question of it being an artifact. Um, also beware of slow flow mimicking thrombus in large aneurysms in, in vessels downstream to these aneurysms and in the left atrial appendage. 
and always consider delayed fan scans in people with really complex congenital heart disease, particularly those with single ventricle. Um, delayed scans are going to be very helpful in that scenario. Okay, moving on to reconstruction artifacts. This is a very typical appearance of something that we encounter all the time. Patient comes in for chest pain, there's a question of dissection, and we get something like this. This person actually, the, 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 there is a question raised of whether this patient has an acute uh, intramural hematoma. Um, so in this case, you can see on the red arrows are pointing out this area of wall, apparent wall thickening in the anterior wall of the aorta. Certainly looks like it could be an intramural hematoma. It's crescentic, which is good for that diagnosis. Um, and the patient has chest pain. Um, the sagittal, though, you know, he kind of maybe raises some, some suspicion that this might be an artifact. You see this kind of doubling appearance of the sinus here, where there's two sinuses. And then the interface between the two, you've got this, this question mark intramural hematoma. Um, so, you know, this, this um, certainly raised enough question that, um, um, you know, uh, the, the person reading it decided to get a follow-up scan with gating. Um, and sure enough, on the repeat scan where there's ECG gating used, there's no intramural hematoma. Everything looks fine. Um, one can probably argue that you could, you could confidently exclude he intramural hematoma on the basis of this artifact here. And, and certainly it depends a little bit on, you know, your um, comfort level. Um, but um, certainly the, uh, you know, some, some, it's a problem that we need to be aware of. And if you're ever in doubt, ECG gating really is the way to go. Um, other reconstruction errors you may encounter, this is something that I've found, you know, in, in reading coronary CT for several years now, I've found that this is one of the most um, difficult um, uh, artifacts that we see and, and kind of the one that, 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 that can be um, uh, uh, most, um, you know, uh, convincing as far as the, you know, a pathology. Uh, this patient has um, this area of, of severe narrowing in the right coronary artery. Um, so it looks like there's a pretty significant stenosis here in the proximal right coronary artery on both different views. We're doing a MIP, we're doing a curved plantar reconstruction, so, you know, everything we're looking at shows us this area of narrowing. But uh, when we go to a different reconstructed phase in the cardiac cycle, uh, you see that this thing, uh, this portion of the RCA where we saw that narrowing is now totally normal. Um, so, so what's happening here? What's the, what's the problem? And here's just the side-by-side -side comparison. Um, the issue here is that um, oops, um, sometimes you have a little bit of subtle motion um, that happens in uh, cardiac CT examinations where um, you're acquiring different pieces of data at different heartbeats. So for instance, um, you know, if you're doing a step and shoot exam, you're, you're getting a little bit of information on heartbeat A, then you move the patient and get a little bit more on heartbeat B. And when you stitch together that data, um, you can sometimes have just a little bit of misregistration um, at the interface of those two pieces of information from heartbeat A and heartbeat B. And if there's a little misregistration and it happens to be right where the right coronary artery is um, here, then that misregistration can lead to basically kind of chopping off the top of the right coronary artery, which makes it look like a very, very narrow vessel. The other thing you can see, you can see that the contour of the aorta here, there's a little bit of a defect where it kind of has a little bit of a step off. That's another clue. In its most extreme version, these these are this is called the stair step artifact. Um, that's usually easy to tell, but it's it's these more subtle examples where there's just just a little bit of misregistration there. Those are the ones that are harder, um, can, and you really got to keep your eye out for it. Um, the one thing I would suggest is that if you see something that looks like a stenosis, but you don't see any plaque, always be on the lookout for this being an artifact, and make sure to do um, other phases if if you um, if you have them available. Here's another example, something that looks for all the world like a stenosis, um, a severe stenosis in the LED. Um, and we went and checked other phases, and sure enough, that was an artifact as well. So um, these um, subtle motion slash misregistration artifacts can be really tricky and, and really, um, in some cases, look a lot like a real lesion. So definitely something to be aware of and, and make sure always um, to check multiple phases if you have them available uh, whenever you're calling a high-grade stenosis um, to confirm that it does in fact persist. Um, one last coronary CT example here. This is a curved planar reformatted image and we see what looks like tandem stenoses one, two. Um, so one thing 
you know, one kind of rule of thumb with coronary CT, you never want to just use your reconstructions for diagnosis. You always have to confirm any finding on the source images. So when you look at this on the uh, source images, you'll see that actually this is not a stenosis, but rather this kind of hairpin turn in the LED seen here and here. And that hairpin turn um, is basically not tracked very well by the um, vessel tracking software, and so it leads to this in, um, appearance of tandem stenoses. <clears throat> well, going away from cardiac CT, there are other scenarios where we may see in cardiovascular imaging inadvertent or um, you know incorrect post-processing that can lead to problems. This is in the setting of automatic bone removal. So a lot of times if we're doing runoffs, we want to try and use these automatic bone removal software packages so that we can um, remove the bone and, 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 and it allows us to make these very nice MIP and volume rendered images of the vessels. Um, so the bone here has been labeled by the software with blue. Um, so what you can see, the arrows are pointing to portions of the, uh, or excuse me, vessels which have been inadvertently labeled with blue. Um, so in this case, on um, this anterior tibial artery, which goes right next to the um, uh, fibula there, uh, that sort of labeling, that bone labeling, has bled over into the um, uh, artery there. And so what happens is when it does its automatic subtraction, it's going to subtract the artery itself. And so this is what it looks like. You see this um, vessel here uh, on the um, subtracted image. On the right-hand side, we lose the vessel. Um, so this is completely an artifact of the reconstruction, uh, or actually I'm just say the post-processing, um, and is not a real stenosis. So make sure that you're aware of these things. And again, you always want to confirm any findings on source images. Here's just another example. Um, this is some vessels around the hip where you can see that there's loss of these vessels due to um, uh, the thresholding-based software. So this is the traditional method for uh, subtracting bone. Usually you use a threshold so the software finds the bone and um, uses a thresh Hounsfield unit threshold to decide whether it's bone or not, um, and then kind of tracks the bone around and, um, and is able to separate bone from um, vessel with some artifacts. The other way of subtracting bone is using dual energy software. Dual energy software uses two different tube currents to actually image the um, anatomy at two different energy levels and the differences in absorption at different energy levels um, can help determine whether something is iodine or bone and it turns out that iodine and bone behave differently with respect to the different energy levels and, and you can capitalize on those differences to allow uh, one to decide or the software program I should say decide what whether it's a piece of bone or, or a vessel uh, even when it's the same, same or similar Hounsfield units. So you can see that these vessels, which were inadvertently subtracted on the threshold-based uh, algorithm, are actually now back on the dual energy algorithm, although you do see that it's not perfect. Here's a portion of the vessel here, which was subtracted on both. So unfortunately, nothing's perfect. And again, you need to always look at your source images. Another example of dual energy uh, versus traditional bone removal software. Um, in this case, on the AT as well, in this case, the mid to distal AT, you lose the vessel, um, and it comes back when you use dual energy software. So just to sum up, reconstruction errors. Um, motion artifacts can simulate dissection or intramural hematoma. You may need to use HCG-gated studies to rule out uh, disease. Motion can be really misleading at coronary CT, so always confirm stenoses on more than one phase and on source images. Um, always use source images to confirm um, uh, stenoses if you see something on the curve planar images. Bone removal software may give um, false appearance of occlusion, so make sure, again, to use source images in that situation as well, and, and you may find that dual energy, if you have it, can be helpful to reduce an appropriate subtraction. Okay, let's go over some normal structures. So sometimes we encounter normal structures which um, mimic disease, and so th this is some that, that apply a little bit to the cardiovascular system. Um, so this is uh, one that we see um, very frequently. This is somebody with who, who's being followed for lymphoma. Uh, there's a, a mass here, anterior to the trachea. Is that a new lymph node? Um, you know, what is always helpful with these kinds of things is always looking at the... 
uh, reconstructed coronal and sagittal images. Um, when you go and look at those ones, you see that this is kind of like a bean-shaped abnormality and kind of hugs the back wall of the um, aorta here. A little bit bigger than your typical lymph node in terms of craniocaudal extent. And um, actually, when you measure it, it measured um, zero Hounsfield units. So this is actually fluid in the superior pericardial recess. This is a really a classic location to have a little bit of pericardial recess fluid. So if you ever see something that looks like it could be a node in that area, I certainly want to just think about whether or not this could be um, the superior pericardial recess. Um, measure the Hounsfield unit density and also look at it on other images to see if it has that kind of elongated shape, which would suggest it's a recess rather than a node. Here's another area where we can see uh, the pericardial recess cause problems. Person has colon cancer and possibly a new nodule in the medial aspect of the right lower lobe. Um, you see it there. You measure it. It's zero Hounsfield units. And you scroll up a little bit higher, and you see that this nodule kind of uh, butts up against the right inferior pulmonary vein. And on the coronal images, it kind of wraps around the vein a little bit even. And what this is, is it's a um, pericardial sleeve recess. So there's a little bit of pericardium which extends out from the heart and actually goes around the inferior pulmonary veins. And that small amount of pericardium is a potential space. And actually some fluid can collect there. And for whatever reason, in some people, you can get these collections of fluid there. And it has a very rounded appearance and can often look like a nodule. One other pericardial recess case, this is somebody who actually came to us from the outside with a history of you know, suspected aortic injury and mediastinal hematoma. Um, so this patient had this fluid around the aorta way up high here around the level of the arch. And when you measured it, it was zero Hounsfield units. Notice the fat here is very clean. There's no stranding, no um, hemorrhage or anything like that. And so the patient was totally fine. There was no traumatic aortic injury. This was just a another pericardial recess. So important to know the pericardial recesses can be quite high. And in this image here, we see it going up to the level of the brachiocephalic artery takeoff, but actually in some patients can go even higher and go up to the arch like we saw in that just that most recent example. So always be on the lookout for these pericardial recesses causing you um, inadvertent or um, um, sort of mimicking uh, disease. Okay, so um, here's another example. This is another case, follow-up lymphoma, question of new lymphadenopathy. We had this new abnormality here. Um, looked a lot like a node on axial images, but then we went to the sagittal image, and sure enough, you can see it's actually a vessel. This is just the azygous vein draining into the superior vena cava. Usually we don't have this problem. Usually there's reflux of contrast into the azygous vein at this level. Why there isn't in this patient, I honestly don't know. But um, it, nonetheless, it's, it's, it's a mimic, and we can certainly tease it out on sagittal images. OK, so um, here are some abnormal structures that are uncommon diagnoses that you may encounter in cardiovascular CT. And you might say, what the heck is this thing? You know, I don't, uh, they're not commonly encountered. So um, these are some, some benign findings that, that are unusual, so um, important to be aware of that they exist so you don't uh, make a, you know, a bigger deal out of them than, than, than you should. Um, so this is one. This is, we've seen quite a few of these, actually, in the past few years. Um, this is a mass here um, in the region of the right atrium, and it's um, the same density as the left atrium. So you've got this, this, this aneurysm, basically, that's projecting out of the atrial septum. Um, it, it looked like um, a mass on CT, and you actually see this little bit of little jet of contrast heading posteriorly from this thing. Um, quite large, um, based on the atrial septum. Here's another couple examples. This patient has one that's lobulated. This patient has one that's pointing the other direction from right to left. But still, the, the, the key defining feature here is that it's matching the blood pool of the adjacent atrium, in this case, the left atrium. In this case, it's the right atrium. And what this is is um, something called an atrial septal aneurysm. And the atrial septal aneurysm is defined by bulging of the fossovallus, and that's the area where in fetal life we had the, um, you know, the um, septum primum and secundum coming together, and there was that, that uh, potential space where blood flowed um, from the right side to the left during um, fetal life. So, so we have bulging of this fossovallus, 10 to 15 millimeter beyond the tissue of the intraatrial septum, and it can go into the left or the right atrium. And actually, if you see it on, say, something like MRI or echocardiography, you can actually see it flip-flop back and forth. 
depending on the prevailing uh, pressures in the atrium, it is associated with PFO in the majority of cases. So if you see it, it doesn't really necessarily have a huge impact on the patient, but generally, if you see it, it means they have a PFO, so it might be important to mention um, for the referring clinicians. Um, if it's filled with unopacified blood, kind of like this example here on the left-hand side, it can mimic a cardiac mass. You know, you might say, oh, is that a myxoma or something like that? So just, just be aware. Um, turns out you can actually get an aneurysm down low as well in the ventricular septum. So this is called a membranous septal aneurysm and it's involving the membranous portion of the interventricular septum of the uh, ventricles here. And you can see that it is actually located below the aortic valve um, and sits right in this membranous portion and usually bulges from the left side to the right because the pressure on the LV side is higher. Um, again, these are generally incidental findings of no clinical consequence. They can occasionally, there have been case reports of them filling up with thrombus or being infected. Um, uh, there is an association with VSD, so you want to look for that. Um, but in the vast majority of cases, it really has no ill effects on the patient. Um, usually on the order of 10 to 15 millimeter of size, 20% um, have VSD. Um, interestingly, in children, they actually see these even more commonly, and there's some thought that this extra tissue plays a role in spontaneous closure of VSDs that can occur in kids. Rarely you might see, as I mentioned, clot or infection. Um, but one th important thing is to distinguish it from a sinus of Valsalva aneurysm, which is kind of the differential. Sinus of Valsalva aneurysm should be up here involving the sinus and located above the valve, whereas this is below the valve involving the interventricular septum. Here's another one. This is a case we had, um, something that looks like a mass on echo here and here. What the heck is this thing? Um, don't uh, call it a circumflex coronary artery aneurysm. It's sitting right next to the circumflex artery. It's very bright. Um, but notice it's a little bit lower, higher than blood pools. Not exactly the same attenuation, um, kind of a lobulated look to it. Um, and it turns out this is caseous mitral annular calcification. This is a mass that lives in the mitral annulus. So you look back at this image, you see this is the mitral valve. It's sort of living right at the base of the mitral valve there. Um, and for whatever reason, you can get a lot of calcium there. We, we see mitral annular calcification all the time. And in some patients, it can become mass-like. Um, and this mass is composed of calcium, cholesterol, and cells. Um, and it can look you know, very much like a, a, a discrete mass, particularly in cardiac MRI. It can be quite um, um, uh, confusing. Um, it is benign, but it can distort the valve by mass effect. And it may even erode in some patients and result in distal levelization. Generally, they're left alone. Um, important thing, don't mistake it for coronary artery aneurysm or some other type of uh, mass that you might um, be concerned about. Another example, this person has um, extensive uh, mitral annular calcification, kind of all in kind of a mass-like pattern. Um, this person has, you know, a couple areas of mass, uh, a mass-like coronary, um, excuse me, annulus calcification here as well. Okay, what about this case? This is a patient who had uh, lymphoma, and lymphoma involved in the pericardium, uh, which was uh, here and here. And they were basically following the patient um, with PET um, to see, you know, if they're responding to therapy. And all the lesions were getting better, except there was this new uptake back here in the heart. So the question was, is this patient progressed? Do we have new lesions, um, new cardiac metastases or cardiac involvement by lymphoma? Uh, or is it something else? Um, and so the answer is, uh, of course, something else. Um, what this is, is uptake in the atrial septum, um, and you can get brown fat um, in the atrial septum, and it's more common with this diagnosis, which is lipomatous hypertrophy of the intraatrial septum. So in these patients, you get the prominent fat in the intraatrial septum, and it turns out that um, a lot, of, uh, not infrequently, if you do a PET CT, you may actually see some uh, FDG uptake localizing to this fat. Um, so the key thing to look for on the PET scan, does the FDG correspond to fat in the atrium? And if it does, then that's going to be um, this entity. That's going to be brown fat within this entity of lipomas hypertrophy, the intraatrial septum. Um, this is a benign entity. It's basically just you get fat around the heart and particularly around the right atrium and in the intraatrial septum. Um, generally, no problems at all. Um, it's uh, you do occasionally encounter it in patients who were referred to CT or MRI from echo because they thought they saw mass. Um, again, it can be hot on PET, um, but, the, but if you see the fat density, 
and the typical location. Um, this is a benign lesion, a leave alone lesion. The only instance where it could cause any problems would be if it's obstructing the IVC inflow. Um, I'm sorry, I should say SVC inflow, um, but that's very, very rare. Okay, my uh, last category of um, artifacts here or, or potential sources of error are overlooked diagnoses. Um, and so, um, you know, I do a lot of uh, teaching and I, I read out residents in the morning and fellows and this is probably one of the more common misses that I see among uh, residents and fellows working overnight. Um, this is one of those edge of the film, uh, end of the scan kind of findings. Um, you see this uh, SFA um, uh, occlusion. Um, so, you know, we scan a lot of patients that are older patients, a lot of patients with vascular disease. These SFA occlusions are really common. Um, if you miss them, certainly you're probably not going to kill the patient, but uh, if, if you do see it, it's always good to mention it. Maybe the patient is having claudication symptoms, you know, maybe it's important, maybe the patient had a, uh, this is rather an embolus and maybe they're throwing emboli from some other source. So certainly could be important. It's important to, to mention if you see it. Um, always good to kind of keep that in mind and keep that on your, um, um, you know, in your normal routine when you're evaluating these scans. Um, here, this is the other one that I see all the time that, that really comes up frequently um, and, and is missed oftentimes over multiple examinations, and that is clot in the LV, and particularly clot in the LV apex. There are a lot of patients out there who have had previous um, uh, heart attack, and previous, um, that previous MI leads to um, uh, a thinned and dilated uh, left ventricle, and particularly the left ventricle, ventricular apex seems to be a common place for that. And if you ever see an LV apex where it's dilated and, and bulging out, but there's extra tissue in it like this, that is basically a clot until proven otherwise. You can see it here and here. Um, those patients often get clot, and they, and they will treat them with anticoagulation because of the risk of distal embolization, for instance, like stroke. Um, so, so you definitely want to mention it if you see it. Um, we see these all the time, and generally they don't know about them until we find them. Here's another example. Um, and we catch them on non-gated studies um, most of the time. So, so just be on the lookout. I tell all my trainees, you know, you always want to just take a quick glance at the heart, make sure there's no areas of thinning or anything like that. And, and if you do see areas of thinning or dilation, make sure to look carefully for any clot um, because certainly the, the clot has a predisposition to these areas of um, reduced um, function. Here's another one, a bigger one. This is a, a big clot here in the apex. The other thing I tell um, trainees is that, you know, the apex is always the thinnest area of the heart, even in normal people. So if you ever see any tissue filling in the apex, um, you have to be suspicious. And so in this case, you certainly can see this big clot in the apex, again, not known previous to the CT. Um, now that we're scanning faster and faster, we also have to um, deal with the fact that we're going to start seeing cardiac structures better than we ever have before. And so um, that brings around the problem that we may actually have cardiac pathology um, that is now visible that we wouldn't have otherwise seen. And so um, it does, I think it is worthwhile um, if we're doing PE studies or any sort of chest imaging just to take a glance at the heart again and just make sure we're not seeing any large, um, you know, obvious abnormalities. In this case, this was an incidental uh, coronary aneurysm with thrombus uh, discovered on a PE study. Um, so certainly that has some importance for this patient. Um, this is a different case. This is a patient who came in with a, for a PE study. The PE was negative, but they had chest pain. And um, if you look closely at the heart, you can see that there's reduced perfusion here of the septum compared to the lateral wall. And in particular, if you look at the reconstructed short axis view, and we re reconstructed this from a non-gated scan. So um, you do have a little bit of um, artifact, but I think it's pretty obvious here that you have really reduced perfusion of the septum and the inferior wall compared to the anterior wall and the lateral wall here. So this patient um, is having uh, ischemia uh, and was, was, was um, basically, I think they were still waiting for the enzymes and when they came back, sure enough, the patient had, was having an infarct. So um, something that we don't really see too much on our PE studies, but you're not going to see it if you don't look. So, so definitely something to, to pay attention to. Okay, so that's my last example, and just, just to summarize, uh, misdiagnoses in cardiovascular CT can come from a variety of sources.
ranging from technical error to reader oversight. Um, contrast artifacts for sure are common. Uh, always be on the lookout and, and think about doing delayed scans or biphasic injection protocols as a routine to help avoid these errors. Um, stenosis on cardiac CT should always be confirmed on source images and more than one phase to avoid those motion or misregistration artifacts that I showed. And familiar with several benign but uncommon cardiac structures uh, can help avoid confusion when they're encountered. So, so that's everything, and I appreciate your attention. Um, thank you very much.